<laughs> Thanks very no, much. Thank uh, so I'm just going to share my screen. And, uh, you know, I really hate this. And, and you're, I'm going to talk really soon about how much I hate PowerPoint. But it, it occurred to me last night that if I didn't have a presentation to share, it's, it's just my face on, this, on the screen. And that seemed, that seemed really scary. So I've got some really rubbish slides um, that you can enjoy. Um, so I'm Jo Facer. I am the principal of Arc Stone Academy, which is a new free school opening in Ealing. I have written a blog called Reading All the Books since 2013. And my book, Simplicity Rules, was published last year by Routledge. And it's the same title as the title of this talk because I hate to let a good pun go to waste. And I think now, right now, we're talking so much in our lives about how, how we are returning to the very basics of life. You know, we're all really happy to be here and our priorities are really changing and I want to talk today about simplicity in the classroom and how we might use some of these ideas to when when we go back you know thank goodness we get to go back at some point I know we're all missing our, our children so much um, how we might be able to both improve what we do and also improve our own work-life balance and so this book that I wrote was sort of born out of the series of colossal errors that I was making. I had massively overcomplicated my practice as a teacher and so today I'm going to talk about five big errors I made and what I would suggest to do instead. So the first error um, that I made was in making a million resources. Hang on, my for some reason I can't move on my slide. There we go. So Error number one is uh, having a, this is why I hate PowerPoint by the way, a million lesson resources. So what I did in my first year of teaching is I would jot down my ideas for the lesson. I would then type them into a lesson plan. I would then make that lesson plan into a PowerPoint. And also from that lesson plan, I'd make like three or four worksheets. And this was insane. So I was working really long hours, but also actually it wasn't, that effective in the classroom I was wasting so much of the children's learning time handing out loads of different worksheets at uh, the PowerPoint it was just so rigid I would spend lots of time at the end of the lesson copying and pasting all the slides I didn't get to onto the next lesson um, and it just seemed like this never-ending rubbish mash of slides uh, and, and I want to sort of think back actually. So when I started teaching um, in 2010, we did this thing with Teach First where you got to go and uh, teach in someone else's school. And I was there with a colleague. We were going to team teach our 20 minute lesson and Teach First said, you've got four hours to plan your lesson. And we were like, that is so little time. So we had our four hours to plan this lesson. And the class teacher really kindly gave up some of her break time and she came to see us and she said, you know, of course you're gonna to want to make a PowerPoint. And we nodded. And when she left, myself and, and this other trainee teacher, it was like, have you used PowerPoint before? What is PowerPoint? And we, we just, so we like fumbled around on the computer and we managed to get some slides open and we couldn't work out how to get pictures from the internet. So we just looked at clip art. So we had this, this crazy PowerPoint full of clip art. And when we, ca we came to the lesson and there's myself trainee teacher, my other trainee teacher, we're there together. The actual class teachers in the back and there's two TAs in the room. Like there could not have been more adults in this room to teach this 20 minute lesson. And we spent the whole time kind of trying to teach and then running back to the teacher's desk to click the next slide on the PowerPoint. And the, you know, at one point we sort of put a clip art picture that the children found really ridiculous and funny and we kind of lost the class. So it was a horrible disaster. Uh, but I learned, I learned really quickly. And so by the end of my first year of teaching, I was delivering these like 30 slide PowerPoint lessons and thinking that I was pretty good at it. But I came to realize that there are a number of issues with PowerPoint as a teacher. So as a teacher, I think big issue is on literacy and how much reading children do on a power. If you have a PowerPoint, you just have these bullet points and the children are never really engaging with extended sentences, like full sentences. So there's not enough text. PowerPoint splits children's attention. So, you know, they're looking at the worksheet, they're looking at the exercise book, they're looking at the slide, they're looking at the worksheet, they're looking, they're, they're looking at all these different things rather than 
focusing on the one thing, the one bit of learning. The other thing I really hated about PowerPoint was how dark it made all the rooms. So I remember the first time I was walking around a school um, before I started Teach First and it was midsummer, and every room was just depressing. Like it was so dark all the time. And then as a teacher, I found that as well, when I, was, when I was teaching, if I had the lights off so they could see the PowerPoint, they then couldn't see their books very well. And it just the whole thing made it really challenging. Uh, it obviously takes a lot of time to make a PowerPoint, although not one as, as basic as the one you're now seeing. Um, and, and then I guess the other thing is that technology fails and it fails all the time. As a teacher myself, I know that technology fails and I would find at least once a week some issue with my board, some issue with, uh, with, with what I was trying to do with my PowerPoint. Um, and now what I do at the moment is I go to a few different schools and I'm really surprised at how much technology fails people. I, 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 you know, I would see sort of 10 teachers in a day and one of them would have had a problem with tech. So those are the reasons I really hated PowerPoint as a teacher. I came to hate PowerPoint having loved it. But as, I guess as a leader, as a head of department, you know, and, and as SLT, my issues with PowerPoint have changed slightly because I, I can accept that if you make your own PowerPoint and you deliver it to your children, you can deliver a really good lesson. That, that is fair, I, I, I accept that. But the issue now for me is that we more and more we are sharing curriculums across trusts, across um, classrooms, across teachers. And it's, PowerPoint is really hard to share. I, I've never seen a shared area revolving around PowerPoint that doesn't have like five copies of the same PowerPoint with minimal changes and teachers' initials after them. And, and the problem, the, the sort of the corollary problem of that is that teachers aren't always making the right changes on their PowerPoints. Um, and they're focusing sometimes on the surface features of the lesson rather than the intellectual preparation required to deliver the lesson. Because when you are looking at PowerPoint slides, it's really hard to think about what, what you as a teacher need to think deeply about in order to deliver that lesson. So I'm going to introduce the, the new way, or which is the old way, which is instead of using PowerPoints and, and millions of resources, instead, I would give yourself the stricture of just two pages per lesson and everything needs to go on those two pages. So one side of A4 uh, over, over two sides. Um, and then you just, you hand it out once. So you're not wasting children's time handing out loads and loads of worksheets. It means that the children's attention is fully on what you're teaching them. And that you as a teacher, when you do your preparation to deliver that lesson, you are working on the content that the children will be working on. It makes your intellectual preparation just so much more rigorous. Um, a few, only a few weeks ago, strangely, I was at the West London Free School History Conference and uh, Louis Everett shared this wonderful talk about how they use uh, Rob Peel's history textbooks at West London Free School. And because Rob Peel's textbook is, is wonderful and it's two pages, and what Louis said was that they are looking, when they look at teachers' preparation, they just say, like, show me your annotations. And so teachers open that textbook and they, and they look at those annotations. So if you observe a lesson and you're not sure about the explanations or the, or the subject content or the way that the teacher's explaining, it's a really clear way to say, well, show me what you've annotated. Show me your understanding. Let's talk about this together. And again, you're all really focused on the, the lesson content. Now, um, I do think that those are wonderful textbooks. There are other amazing textbooks out there, but if you have your two side lesson that you have created, uh, the great thing is that the next year, once you've finished, you can collate all of these into a booklet, stick a title page on the front, and then you just have to print it once. So again, you are having much uh, lower workload for yourself uh, because you don't have to sort of battle the photocopier every, every morning at 8 a.m. with everyone else. You just print it off once, hand it out once, and you're done. So instead of a million lesson resources, so that's what I would do um, instead of my first error. My second error is, is connected in that when I train to teach, I would include all the activities, like every single one. Um, I would have kids coming into the room, they've got post-it notes underneath their chairs, uh, the lights are off, the tables are in some kind of weird arrangement I spent my entire break time doing. 
Um, you know, you've got a video playing, but there's no sound. Is there no sound because I want them to think about the meaning or is there no sound because my speakers are broken again? Um, who knows? There's sugar paper, there's fat pens, the, the children are talking about their feelings about Hamlet through interpretative dance. You know, all of these activities are going on. And that was really the orthodoxy behind how I trained to teach. And I think it, it stemmed from my training, but it also stemmed from really low expectations, which is really hard to admit. When I visited the school I would teach in, someone there said to me, these children can't just sit and read and write. They won't do that. And I believed them. You know, I believed that these children were different. These children couldn't handle really difficult work. And so I really underestimated what they could do. And I just thought that I had to entertain them every lesson. And you know what? I'm not even that entertaining. Like no English lesson is as entertaining as YouTube. It just isn't, it isn't going to happen. And, and what is happening when you have all of these activities is that children are expending their energy coming in and thinking, what, how are we learning today? Why are the tables tipped up? You know, what are the, what's the sugar paper for? Rather than spending their energy thinking about the learning. And so that for me was the really big turning point around activities. I want the children to think about what I'm teaching them, not about how I'm doing it. So I've come to a really sort of simple way of teaching where I give them some recap questions because we know that testing children helps to strengthen their retention of core knowledge. They read something, we talk about it, I ask a load of questions, they ask a load of questions, and then they write something. And it really is that simple. And you know, it doesn't, it, not everyone's a fan. You know, one of my favorite classes I've ever taught last year, my year 10s, they were wonderful, but there was this one boy in every single lesson, he came and he queued up for the lesson so, so brilliantly. And he went, miss, are we reading again? And every, every day I said, it's always the same, <laughs> always the same. And no, he didn't, he didn't love my lessons, but he learned a lot and he was really, really good at English um, after a couple of years. Uh, of, of this method. It really worked for him. So error number three, marking. Um, when I started teaching, my first two schools had the policy where you had to mark your students' books every other week. I used to mark my students' books every week because I was always that kid. I was like, I'm going to do this so well. Um, but also because I was not very good at teaching. And I read this book um, by Phil Beadle, where he talked about how if you weren't, I'm paraphrasing, if you weren't a brilliant teacher, but you marked the books really well, the children would learn something. And that is true. That is absolutely true. Um, and, and you know what, that some of my lessons were so chaotic that the thing that I wrote in the child's book that they could read, that's pretty much all they could learn in my lessons. Obviously, that's not good enough. And so, you know, I, I'm painstakingly marking these books and someone from Teach First, they, they did a project where they were like, we can come into your room, we can ask the children anything you want to find out about. So I was like, well, I'm spending most of my week marking, so let's make sure I'm doing a decent job of it. Can you ask the children how they find my marking, how they think I could improve it? And, and so she took the children out and she did this kind of survey with them. And one child who whose name I do remember, but I won't share now, said, I don't find Mrs. Marking helpful at all. This is like in the second year of me teaching her. So I've marked her book for two years at this point. And, and she said, oh, why don't you find it helpful? And this student goes, can't be bothered to read it. <laughs> so I've been like spending all of my days marking and there's children out there going just can't be bothered to read it and so the follow-up question was how could miss make her marking more helpful to you and she said miss could read aloud the comments she's written in my book to help me know how to improve and that made me feel pretty furious um it, you know so i'm doing all this marking are the children learning anything seems seems unlikely. I then moved 
um, and became a member of SLT. And my, my dream, my, my marking every week, it didn't really happen like that once I got a bit busier. And it, it sort of never was my, it was never my priority. And so what I'm writing is very infrequent. And, and I'm writing things like use more ambitious vocabulary. I mean, what's a kid meant to do with that? You know, if they knew, if I read that, well, like what? Like what, what kind of vocabulary? Tell me what to use, because I don't know better words. That's why I've used the words I've used. So marking is really, really hard to get the children to move ahead uh, from where they are. So instead of marking, I now advocate for whole class feedback. So with whole class feedback, instead of writing something in the book, you just read the book. You can do it more frequently because it takes less time. So you're not reading as much, which is the nice virtuous cycle part of this. So you're reading a couple of pages or a page or a paragraph, and you've got a piece of paper next to you. And on the paper, you are writing down merits, like who's done a really good job? Who's done a really good job of their work? You get a merit. You might write down sort of warnings or demerits because some children have done their work really scrappily. They haven't put much effort in. And so you need to make sure you're following up with those children, holding them to account. It's important the children know you look at their books. You are then writing down maybe some spellings that they've got wrong. I would always advocate no more than 10 spellings. It's really hard for children to take in more than that. Um, and similarly, the, and the most important part is the misconception. So what are the things that the children got wrong and why? And what do you as the teacher need to reteach in order to ensure they get it right next time? And when I started doing whole class feedback, I was writing like 12 misconceptions down because I wasn't a very good teacher. And, and, you know, I had loads of things I wanted to address with them. And we were spending a whole lesson where I was reteaching 12 things and trying to cover every part of the class. And that wasn't that effective because there's only so much feedback you can take. And we as adults know this, there's only so much feedback we can take whenever we do things. So with the misconceptions, you know, with the weakest children, I would sometimes just focus on one or two things and really get those things right. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe three, four at a push, but any more than that, and you're starting to lose them. They're not able to take in that much feedback. Now there are always, the, the biggest, thing that people always say about whole class marking is what about the children who do not fall into the category of the misconceptions I've written down? People are really worried about those kids. And what I would say is write those kids' names down and the different thing they do wrong to everyone else. And you think it's going to be loads of kids. It never is. In all my classes, it was one child, maybe two, who really did need something slightly different to what I was giving the rest of the class. And, and actually writing it down is really helpful because you're focusing on how am I going to help that child. So I had one child, for example, really high ability class, but this child struggled with even basic spellings. And so when I gave the feedback and I set them off on their kind of task of here's the thing I want you to do to show you've now understood the misconceptions, I'd say actually for you, here's what I want you to do. And I give them a really targeted different task. And that, so there will be occasional children like that who, who don't quite fit in to what you've given the rest of your group, but it, it's way less than you think it's going to be. Um, and then and the other thing I would always say is to celebrate loads. So if you have a child who's written a brilliant paragraph, like all you need to do on your whole class feedback sheet is write their name. And then you just hold up their book and say, how good is this? Or you put it under the visualizer and you read through it, or you just read it aloud to the class. And, and you know, most children really love that. They really love being celebrated in that way, being the one to have their work shared. It's a really lovely way of doing it. So whole class feedback is definitely better than the error of marking. I've got two more errors to share. Error number four is pedagogy. So I was employing the wrong pedagogy. I remember when I, about a term into my teaching, announcing that I had cracked it. I was like, I know exactly how to improve my teaching. What I've done is I've worked out on the photocopier, I can photocopy an A4 page onto A3 paper, right? And then I can put the A3 paper in the middle of a group table and it's transformed my lesson, transformed it. And it had, because instead of the children shouting across the classroom at their friends, they were just talking to the person next to them because the sheet in the middle put all their heads in the middle of the table. So they just were talking to each other 
much quieter. And that was pretty much my bar. So, you know, I was that teacher who would say, what do you think it means? Have a guess. And then like watch the blank faces. Um, I was the teacher who said, I learn more from my students than they learn from me. Because it was pretty true, because my kids would teach me who the latest rap artists were, and I would just ask them what they thought and teach them nothing. So they really did teach me. Um, and it was, it was pretty bad. And <laughs> I remember, so for me, like the, the kind of seminal moment was reading Dan Willingham's Why Don't Students Like School? And he talked, and I remember reading, I think he talks a lot about memory and like no one's mentioned memory before. So no one's mentioned it in my training. I've never thought about it like that. Like, how is this memory thing important? And then I thought about my, you know, my year nine class where I taught them for three years and yet every year we got to poetry and I had to teach them again what a metaphor was. Like, how did they not know that? And that's not, that's not their fault. That's, that's my fault. So so it was just wrong it was wrong and it was really it was really sad because my children didn't learn as much as they could have learned and I really regret that and it's really hard to change what you do in the classroom especially when you've done it for years but I found myself coming to this sort of threefold focus so when I think about teaching now there's only really three questions we need to answer as teachers the first is are they listening so a big part of our teaching has to be checking the kids actually paying attention. And in some schools, this means behavior management, getting them to be quiet. In some schools, you have really compliant children, but they're not listening. So it's that kind of frequent dialogic teaching, frequently asking the children question after question after question to check their listening. Uh, the second, no less important, is to check they understand. So really important to check the children are listening and then do they understand what you're saying? And then I think the third question about that, that we need to find the answer to as teachers of our classes is do they remember? So a big part of us improving our pedagogy is working out how to ask the right questions and enough questions that we know if they remember and if they understand and if they are listening, but to also be asking the questions that help children start to connect all of their knowledge um, to, to what, they've, what they've learned before, what they've remembered before. So that's my fourth error. My final error, probably, probably the biggest error, is it was bad behavior. The children, not mine. Behavior, we know that good behavior is crucial to good learning. If children are not listening, they are not learning. And when, I feel, I, I've gone into a lot of classrooms over the, the you know, 10 years I've been teaching. And the amount of times that teachers are, are teaching 100% of the class, is, is quite depressingly rare. So I see a lot of 80% teaching with 20% of the class clearly not listening, not learning, not behaving. And sometimes the ratio is not even that good. I know for me in my first year teaching classroom, if you come in, I was teaching 5% of the class because nobody else was listening. Good behavior is about good systems. It's not gonna ever be innate. You know, I, I've, you know, I, I visited Eton and saw kids badly behaved. It's, it's not about, you know, kids are kids. They're going to badly, they're going to behave badly. You need to have really strong systems to help them do the right thing. Obviously, my, my answer early on was to use group work to engage children, engage children, at least get them to be a bit quieter. I don't think that's the right thing. I think it is down to SLT to have a policy that works and then it's down to the teacher to use it. Now I would say for teachers is, is what I would never do is make your own policy, like never make your own behavior policy. Because if you turn up to a school and you say, right kids, we're gonna do it my way, not the school's way, you pit yourself against the school. And children are so attuned to fairness. They are so attuned to consistency and they pick up straight away if their teacher isn't doing what everyone else does. So use the policy. And of course, feed up, feed up to your head of department, feed up to your SLT line manager. It's not working. We need to do something different. Um, and, and hopefully, in, if you are SLT, always listen to teachers on full time tables. Always listen to your brand new teachers because it's not good enough to say they're just inexperienced. Like the policy has to work for everyone. It has to work for your new teachers. It has to work for your supply teachers. And if it doesn't work for them, you need to change it because I've seen plenty of schools at this point that have a behavior system where 
anyone can teach literally anyone and that is that's really important particularly in a time of sort of recruitment crisis um, but not just slt you know i um one of one of my colleagues um lizzie bowling was a head of department in a really challenging school and as a head of english she took it upon herself to take hold of behavior behavior was really difficult across the school but she instituted a department policy she is the head of the department had a bit more clout went to every classroom said here's how you behave in english and she had a, a policy that worked and so what happened was english in that school became like an oasis of calm and so great middle leaders can do that. You can absolutely own the behavior in your area. And I would really encourage you to take that and to make something that works and to support your teachers with it. Um, if you don't have a behavior system in your school, there are still schools out there without behavior systems, scary as it sounds, make your system really simple. I would have three stages. One is a, some kind of warning. You know, people hate, I hate the word warning. I hate it because it gives them an out. Um, I like demerit because it, it doesn't lead to a detention, but it kind of sounds like something bad's happening. So give them a warning or a demerit. The second is a detention. The third is something worse. I would always make sure you start really, really small. I've worked in schools that do one hour detentions. I've worked in schools that do 15 minute detentions. And really, it's not that different. I think Bill Rogers is the one who says that it's not the severity of the sanction that matters, it's the certainty of the sanction. And if you find yourself threatening three weeks of one hour detentions, and then they continue to misbehave, you've got nowhere to go. So start really small so you can build it up. So just a quick recap on the five solutions to these five colossal errors I made in my teaching career. Instead of using billions of lesson resources that sap your time, sap your life and distract the children. Just have two pages for every lesson. Instead of having billions of activities and loads of different things, remember that children thrive on consistency, not variety. They love to know what is coming and when and how. Instead of marking every single book all the time, give whole class feedback. The feedback is better for the children and it's better for your work-life balance. Instead of thinking about how you can make your lesson fun or do different things, focus your pedagogy on understanding, attention and memory. And finally, with behaviour, have a system that works and use it. And that is all I have to say. And I told you it would be really quick because I don't have much of an attention span and I wonder if you do. Maybe you do, maybe you're better than me, but thank you so much for, for listening. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you very much, Joe. Do you want to stop sharing your screen so we can see you? Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. So, um, don't worry, I'll just pin you there. So thank you very much. Um, we did have um, a few questions coming in. Um, I know you just picked that up at the end in your final slide, but um, someone was asking, just to clarify, did you say two slides per lesson or two sides of paper? Ah, I'd say two sides of paper. So I wouldn't use slides at all. I mean, occasionally I would use the slide for like a picture of something that you really need, but I think slides don't give you the ability to focus on the content. Whereas if you have two sides of A4, you've got some real chunky content in there as a part of it and you can kind of annotate it to prepare to teach it. Okay, thank you. Actually, someone was just asking, could you show the last slide again with your five solutions? Um, Maybe we'll come back to that in a second. I got it. <laughs> um, can I keep it up or does, is that okay? Yeah, yeah I'm sure. Okay, so um, I know that there are lots of departments at the moment exploring um, uh, creating booklets. Um, so someone says here, we're in the process of creating booklets, but we are really worried about the cost. So what are your experiences of printing costs and how do you keep the cost down? Uh, is it internal or um, do you have an external printing company? So 
something quite practical here. Yeah. Um, actually, so I, I got um, an external company to give me a quote for the print costs, and it was significantly more than buying a really good printer that would do that really cheaply. So there are really good printers out there that you can get as a sort of a bulk capital purchase. Um, I think the other thing to say is that the two page constraint really helps. So I have a colleague who really likes doing workbooks and the kids write in the book, they, they write in the booklet. But the problem with that is it takes loads of paper. Whereas if you have the constraint that you have just two pages per lesson, if you think about the amount your teachers are printing anyway, wouldn't it be a really rare lesson that they didn't have at least one piece of paper that the children had? I mean, I've, I've not seen lessons in a long time that didn't have one piece of paper in front of them. So that's one way that you sort of rationalize the cost, which is we're talking about two sides of A4 per pupil per lesson. The other way to keep costs down, so I taught my, my sixth form class last year and we had um, copies of Antigone and you can get Antigone really cheaply on Amazon. You can get like those really thin copies of it, um, which actually is cheaper than printing it. And so instead of having two pages per booklet, what I would do is I, I'd put the recap and the task and then in the middle it's like read pages blah to blah and so instead of having a two page booklet I had like a, a half page booklet essentially for that so everything is still there uh, but then I as a teacher had to be really hot on like annotating my copy of Antigone because that's the bit that I needed to do loads of thinking about hmm. yeah thank you um quite a few questions coming in um still wondering about those two pages you know, and wondering how that would work with children who are BAL or struggle with reading. So how would you deliver, um, or, or indeed we have a question asking about um, send pupils as well. Do you, yeah. do you do resources for them? The, the thing that's amazing about giving children a lot of reading to do is how rapidly it improves their reading. Um, and I, there's no one better on this than, in fact, there's two people who are great to read on reading. So Dan Willingham, Raising Kids Who Read, is one of my favorite books on reading. It's amazing. Um, and then Doug Lamov in Teach Like a Champion, he talks about the best way to read with your class. So I accept that it, it can be really hard. So if you had like two sides of dense text, that's really, really hard. What we tend to do is we would, some of that text we would italicize so that it's not the crucial bit. So there's a bit less reading, but they still are reading a lot. And it's important that they read a lot because otherwise we're just, otherwise we're just continuing to deprive our weakest readers of the opportunity to practice reading. And it is painful and it's difficult. But if you set the expectation, we all read aloud and then you support children. So using Lamov's Control of the Game is a great technique. And with Send Learners, I would just give a slight tweak um, in that the first few times you ask them to read aloud, first of all, look through the reading, find all the really simple sentences, like the, the four word sentences and highlight them. And I would even write the kid's name on top of it. So I, as a teacher, like there's no way that kid can't read that bit aloud. There's no way, they know how to read it. And then the other thing is with some children, they're really anxious. And you do just at the first few times you go over to them and you whisper, I'm gonna ask you to read this sentence, you need to be ready. And they like having that preparation. And it's, it's amazing how, how little of that they need before they then will just read aloud. And, and for me, this was really brought home. I, I taught a sort of a nurture group, year 10 class. And I, I thought, you know, they, I'd heard some of them read aloud before and they struggled with really basic words that they just couldn't decode. They were just guessing, they sight guessed the words. So I used to read at them a lot. And in this amazing lesson, this kid starts reading at the same time I'm reading. And I, I always think like if I'd been in a worse mood, I might have told them off and be like, what are you doing? You're making fun of me. But I wondered what was happening and I just kept reading and then I just got quieter and quieter and the kid kept reading. And then they read and then they stopped and they were like, I'm done now, miss. And so I read again. And, and another child from this little nurture group, again, chimes in and starts reading. And, and for me, that was a real moment of, I have underestimated these children. Like I thought they couldn't do it, but they could. And they literally showed me they could. And so I, I get that children really struggle with reading. I totally get that. But I think they can read more than sometimes we ourselves think is possible. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question here, how do you teach model examples effectively in a booklet without splitting the attention of children? 
Yeah, that's a that's a really good challenge. So I've I, I've got a few thoughts on models. I think you know if you're working with a lot of inexperienced teachers or teachers teaching out of their subject specialism, it's really good to have pre-prepared models in the booklets because you know. So I had to teach geography last year, and I am not a geography specialist, and I found it incredibly hard because I didn't know what a great paragraph in geography looked like. I really couldn't teach them. I, they, I had no idea myself of what I wanted them to do. And when we got a geography specialist came in and, and wrote all these models, it was much easier for me to say, this is, this is great. This is what you need to be aiming for. Um, so I would build those paragraphs into the booklet. Eventually though, I think the best way to model is not through reading a paragraph, it's through physically you as the teacher writing the paragraph. And that comes with time and expertise. So when I was in my first year of teaching, even as an English specialist, I couldn't have written a really good model paragraph um, because I hadn't internalized what that looked like yet. I mean, honestly, the, the top set kids I taught in my first couple of years of teaching, they taught me what a great model paragraph was meant to look like at GCSE level, because that just wasn't something that was widely available or talked about back then. So now I, I yeah, I do. I put my, I put my um, desktop on and I put the, visual, the um, projector on and I, I mean, I type into Word because my handwriting is appalling, so I could never use a visualizer. And I, I literally talk through my, my thought process and I write it and, and I try and make it quite, interactive because you ideally you want the children to be you want to kind of be asking the children and getting them to it's almost like a we do rather than an i do if that makes sense yes yes indeed um clearly some schools stipulate that uh, teachers must use slides that are centrally planned um even you know allowing for adaptation but how would you simplify how can you simplify planning in this way if this happens yeah um, so, you know, I'm working with a school at the moment that has, a, so ARC has amazing centralised curriculums, um, but they are in PowerPoint for most of them, not all of them. Uh, and I remember, so I was working with a, a new teacher in science and the advice I gave, because, because they, you know, she's a novice teacher, brand new to teaching. So actually her changing around the PowerPoint wasn't going to be the most impactful thing for her to do. So I just said, print the PowerPoint out and annotate the PowerPoint. And, and because the thing that worries me is that we need to be focusing our attention on the stuff, on the stuff we're teaching. Like, how will I communicate this difficult idea to those children I teach? That is our preparation. And I just think like sitting at a computer is very, very hard. People find it really hard to do that. Um, so that's the advice and then you've got your kind of PowerPoint print out in front of you and you've got all of your, your knowledge and the things that you're focusing on and I, and I would just be doing it like that if your school really is saying PowerPoint at the same time you know I've, I've had taken PowerPoint curriculums I've just built it into a booklet and and what's, what, what tends to happen when I do that is that teachers other teachers really like it and so it's almost like you say I've made this thing it works in my class do you want it so that if the challenge is you're not using the slides like, but of course i am you know i've got all the text from the slides outlined exactly as it was in the slides it's just in a booklet with a few of x you know you can add extra paragraphs you can flesh out the bullet points so there's a bit more reading for the children you can do all kinds of positive things with that um but then it's a, it's a booklet form and it's really easy to share and then you i i found that colleagues really want that Thank you. Your sound was breaking up a little bit there, so I hope it's still okay for people to hear. Um, we've got a few questions on whole class feedback. Um, one was um, asking about um, whether you have a pro format, because at the moment they have something quite messy. Um, so how do you plan it? Do you have one? Um, and do you train teachers in using it? Um, and someone else was asking about uh, how do you recommend evidencing whole class feedback in pupils books which is quite telling of the culture that yeah, we have no, I totally understand that and okay so I my my thinking at the moment is is this it's like where you have professionals who are struggling you give more guidance and more support so if I have professionals who are really bright, who, who are really experienced, who, who have been doing this a long time and I say give whole class feedback the only evidence I need to see if that's working is looking at the children's books. Are the kids getting better at writing? If they are, your whole class feedback is working. All power to you. 
I think it's helpful to have it written down, but I, I, I don't normally care about how it is. I think it's really helpful in line management to talk about it because, you know, when I, when I, I worked in a school where the policy was you brought your feedback sheets to line management and the person talking to me had some really good suggestions like why are you focusing on this why not focus on that or and getting me to talk through and I would say things like I just don't know what to do about this particular student and it's really helpful because it's right in front of you so I definitely think write it down in some form I think if you do have teachers or a majority of teachers who are struggling or if you kind of want to give so sometimes I think, you know, you give more structure at the start and you say we use the pro forma and then when people get used to doing whole class feedback, you don't really care so much if they're using the pro forma. So I, my school last year, we had one. It was really simple. It had at the top merits to remind you to give merits to the kids. It had um, something like missing incomplete or messy work. So it's like the kind of checking that they're keeping their books neat, which we thought was important that they took pride in their work. We had a box for spellings. So everyone just remembered to teach some spellings. The biggest box was misconceptions and reteach. And at the bottom, it was like individual students. So like that's where you would put your need to call this kid's mum or need to do something really different with this kid. Thank you. Um, and so would you never mark individual books at all? Um, no, I, well, one thing I would do though is make sure that in your curriculum planning you are giving children an average of 20 minutes silent independent work most of lessons and I would circulate with a red pen because yeah there's you know I want to correct the spelling or I want to rewrite your sentence in front of you so you see what I mean. I might yeah I would definitely have a pen with me and, and put some marks in children's books but not in a I wouldn't worry too much about that. Well, I think the thing I would worry about is, are my children, is, is their writing getting better? And, and that's the only measure of it. Because if their writing's not getting better with your whole class feedback, then don't use it because it's not working. The, the, the thing we have to focus all of our energy on is getting children's work to improve. And whatever works for that, this is just one method that I think is really good for work-life balance that I have found leads to children improving their writing rather than me writing endless targets and them going, can't be bothered to read it. So how would you go about trying to convince the, um, SLT that that's the way to go? <laughs> Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? It's, it does take a brave SLT. You know, I, I tell the story in my book about this amazing teacher I worked with years ago now when I was the head of department and I had this heartbreaking meeting where I'd done a book look and I, I, and I wanted to open with the positive, which was true, which was your kid's writing has improved more than anyone else's in the department. And then I had to follow up with, but you're not marking books and you need to mark books. And this teacher was so furious and just like, what do you mean? Like, you've you just said my kids write best than anyone else's kids. My results last year were amazing. What, what you are? And I was like, well, it's the school policy. It's the school policy. And I was that person. And that's really, really shameful. Um, for me, it was that. It was like watching that a, a great teacher could get the best results. And it's, you just need to say, look, look at how well the kids are improving. They, they, if you look at the if you look at their writing from two weeks ago and you put marks in their book and you give it to them we have his children going I don't even remember that poem I've lost my worksheet I can't like, they can't improve it they can't get better at it whereas if you're always giving them the feedback this is the last thing you wrote you wrote it yesterday we're improving it today here's what you did wrong here's what you need to do now it's so much easier for them to improve and you can see it so how often would you collect the books to have a look at the work I'm actually having this um, discussion with my, the SLT at Arkstone at the moment, because initially I was like, got to be every week. Um, but they were much smarter than me and said, that doesn't work for all subjects. So for example, you know, someone who's teaching RE once a week and someone who's teaching English five times a week, should they be looking at the books the same amount of times? Probably not, they've got more children. Um, and that what the, we came to as an SLT was that it should be the head of department it should be their decision on how often they expect to see books looked at, which is filtered through their SLT line manager. So if they say something obviously mad, like if, if our head of science said, we never need to look at books, then the SLT could be like, no, no, no you've got to look at them sometimes. You know, so they, they'd have that slight kind of conversation. But I think it's, it's about trusting really good heads of department with what, is in, what, what the children need. And also, you know, you can see when you go into, again, it's about going into the lesson. It's about looking at the books. If the children are progressing and their, their, their work is getting better, I wouldn't worry about the amount or the frequency. But if, 
if you kind of compare one class with another and you think well this class should be doing much better that's when you have to have those conversations like could you look at the books more could you give them more feedback hmm, thank you um so we have other questions asking about behavior um you talked about you know having a good behavior policy and sometimes managing the to achieve that at department level so um again how would you go about trying to convince uh eslt that perhaps uh the system in place doesn't work and that what's happening in your department does um how would you handle that if i were a head of department i i wouldn't worry about convincing the slt because they either see it or they don't you know if if you come into my department and the behavior is great you know you should be saying what are you doing we need to replicate this as a school if your slt member is willfully blind to that i just think keep doing what you're doing keep controlling like we spend a lot of time stressing ourselves out in schools worrying about what is beyond our control like what is in your control as a head of department is the behavior and the work of the kids in your subject like own it take it share the great practice but that's all you can do and then i would say you know get promoted be a member of slt be that person who <laughs> is always looking at those around you and saying what is the great practice what can we do here thank you um i have a question here do you have any suggestions for helping to motivate to motivate students in an optional subject such like uh, such as mfl for example um, so how do you keep the planning really simple whilst trying to motivate the students? So I'm not an expert in motivation. I actually believe there is an amazing research at home session coming up by someone who is a real expert on that. So I'm definitely going to be tuning into that. So I would, I don't want to pretend to be an expert. The only thing I, the only thing I really know about motivation is that success motivates. So if you can get children being really successful in, in your subject, they will be more motivated to succeed and to, to do more. It's like, you know, I'm really not motivated to run. I'm so rubbish at running um, and, and like, it's really hard. And so like I started with like the miniest run possible and I got really good at it. And I, I was like, oh my gosh, I can like run for 10 minutes without dying. And it was amazing. And, and so I built myself up in that way. And I think it's the same thing, you know, if you, if kids are struggling, if they come to your lesson and lesson after lesson after lesson, they are getting like zero, zero, zero. This is why low stakes testing is so good because the more they're like, oh, five out of five, four out of five, oh my goodness, I'm actually, they start to see themselves as I'm good at French. I am a good language speaker. And, and you start by building that success, you start to change their perception of where they are as a learner. But like I say, I'm excited for the motivation talk coming up. Yes, thank you. Um, thinking about your, um, the approach that you have uh, described, do you think there would be any differences in the way that you approach A-level teaching? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And again, I am not an expert on A-level. I'm really lucky that two, two of my really good friends are these incredible heads of sixth form. And when my school has a sixth form, I'm calling them immediately and just saying, what do you do? I, I taught A-level three or four times now, and I always worry it's the weakest part of my practice. So again, I'm not an expert. I think, I think that A-level is where you do have to pull back. Like it's, it's, it has to be more independent. And the brilliant thing about A-level is in general, they've chosen your subject. So my year 12s last year were so, they were amazing. They loved English. They were passionate about it. They worked really hard. I just remember sort of by week five, I, I had my homework tracker and I was like, do you realize that 100% of people in this room have handed in their homework on time for five? And I was saying a lot of homework. I just had never experienced that in any of the other sixth form. Like I used to chase attendance. I used to chase homework. This class were like beautiful and amazing and I and you know I hope that they're doing okay right now um so with a class like that you know I would set them off on you know a pair discussion or a group discussion and they would they had first of all they had the knowledge so that school had an amazing knowledge rich curriculum from key stage three so they had this brilliant teaching all the way through they had loads of knowledge to draw on so they could have really robust discussions with each other and then the second aspect was they loved english they were there every day they they wanted to do it they wanted to do well and so you know it was a small class so i had three discussions going on and there, there was just they were quiet they were murmuring at no point were they off task it was you know it, it was really beautiful to see i think it's just about judging 
when you can start to let go with your class because you do need to let go you do need to get them to be doing more and more and more i totally accept that but you just have to judge it on your class thank you um we've got a few questions about peer assessment um what do you think about peer assessment um, in lessons and do you use it do you think it's effective how do you manage to, to make it effective yeah so i wrote an article actually a few months ago about why i thought peer assessment was didn't work <laughs> and um, and I think I, I told the story about how when I first heard of peer assessment this was in my my period of manic marking and the way I understood it was you get them to swap books and mark each other's books so I went in and I was like this is it year eight I don't have to take your books in swap mark go and you should have seen some of the comments they wrote were just ridiculous and it was it was embarrassing and what was even more embarrassing was that I kept doing it because I saw it as the way that I just occasionally I was just a breaking point I was like I can't take books home again this weekend and I would just get them to swap books it does it that did not work for things like you know yes no knowledge questions you could use peer assessment but there's also that kind of hyper correction effect isn't there that if you know you've got it wrong and you're corrected straight away, you're more likely to get it right in the future. And if you get them to swap their books, they're missing out on that. Oh my goodness, that was the answer. So I, I, again, I think self-assessment is great. I think that, that, that that's something you can really tightly control as a teacher by. So for example, in my last school, we used to say green pens in hand, we'd watch them and they'd have the green pen and that you could see that they were only marking their work with a green pen rather than trying to change their answers to get it right. Um, but actually, even if they do change their answers to get it right, who cares? Like, the important thing is they're learning and they're getting better rather than, you know, um, who, who marks the book and did they absolutely get 11 out of 12 or did they get 10 out of 12? Like, who cares? It's, it's them learning more. Mm, thank you. Um, we have a question on group work. Um, someone's saying, do you find that students are able to engage fully in lessons without the visual aid? So that was the first part. And then... They mentioned um, they said you said you didn't find group work was helpful so how would you promote exchange of ideas instead in the classroom yeah um, I think I think it is really important that their children think the important thing is that they think about their work right so they talk about it and generally I think that a teacher moderated discussion is the most effective way when they're young because you as the teacher need to be in that discussion so i remember doing a circulate really early on in my teaching career and my question was what do you know about um, what do you know about shakespeare and i overheard a kid say 19th century factories victorian london and i was like no I'm like wrong person um, and that's the problem when you get them to talk to each other before they have that knowledge it, they can just embed a load of misconceptions in each other but and again, it's just that it's the point at which you're like, you've got enough knowledge to have a decent conversation and the behavior is good enough that I trust you to do that. That's going to look really different depending on your class. If you've got like a top set year 10, like fine. If you've got a nurture group year seven, I just don't think it's the right thing for them. It really has to be the judgment of the expert teacher as to when that is appropriate. And visual aids, I mean, I honestly have only found visual aids to be a hindrance. So I found, you know, one, one lesson um, I was teaching about, it was a poem based on a painting. And so I wanted to show them the painting because I thought they can't understand the poem without seeing the painting. And my board broke, so I couldn't show them the painting. Um, and so we, we read this poem and it was, it was a, I thought it was, a, it was an all right lesson. And I actually taught that lesson again that afternoon when my board was fixed. And the, the lesson went way worse because they got so distracted by the painting and then they were focusing on all the wrong things in the painting. And I had to keep redirecting them and saying, no, 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 don't look at that bit. This is the bit I want you to look at. And, and actually when I had just described what they would have seen, their responses to the poem were way better. Now that was a year seven class. So I, I accept that they are much more likely to, you know, hook onto the wrong thing and have the wrong ideas. I think that judiciously used images are, are fine and some, you know, some subjects you, of course you need, you know, I, I watched my amazing um, vice principal or assistant principal deliver a lesson where they had this, this map of the world and it was really, it was really cr crucial to the lesson that they understood the geography of that part of the world and he was sort of talking kids through it and that's, of course, that's necessary, it's clear that that's necessary. It's about finding the tool to suit the purpose. Thank you. Um textbooks 
what do you think about textbooks? Because obviously in some subjects they are very useful, for example, science. So um, yeah. I'm not, I don't particularly think that you would advocate not using textbooks. But how I'm would you back that? I'm, I'm a massive fan of textbooks. So Rob Peel's history textbooks, Rob Orm's RE textbooks are great. Um, if I don't know about science, but yeah, if you can find a great textbook, definitely use it. Like, why would you re reinvent the wheel? Use the textbook. Um, last year, though, I tried to teach geography from an exam board's geography textbook. And while the text was all right, um, the tasks were like, make a poster. This is for year 11. Make a poster exploring, you know, global warming. Um, make a video advertisement about a trip to Africa. Um, so I think... For me, with the textbook, I tended to use just the text and I would write my own questions for it. So def use everything that's out there, of course. Um, and, and like I say, having like a wraparound, so your booklet is a wraparound, your textbook can work really mm -hmm. well. So you always have your recap questions that you plan because I don't know any textbook currently that does recap questions at the start. Um, so you would have to plan those and you might want to plan extended tasks or you might want to plan different questions to the ones that are in the textbook, uh, but definitely use them. Definitely. If they <laughs> and perhaps we'll finish with this one is quite a, a, a fun question. Um, is there any way or is there a good way to transition from um, activity heavy teaching style to the more straightforward reading writing lessons that you are advocating? Uh, or is shock therapy the best course of action? <laughs> so you know how would you go about doing that? I think that a slow transition, I mean, you know, you know the way when you're at NQT and you get feedback from your lesson observation and they go, you just need to be harder and you, know, and you go into the next lesson and you're like, right kids! And you're like a, a drill sergeant and the children are just like, what? Um, in my experience, that didn't work very well for me. Like they needed me to continue to be smiley and happy, but say, but now we need to lay down some group work, uh, group rules. Um, so I think probably it's best to maybe introduce a, like, introduce a recap every lesson. And then just and then introduce a reading every lesson and then introduce you know and then just slowly phase out the group work phase out the activities i don't think they'll even notice they're gone by the end <laughs> <laughs> i might just squeeze in the last one because we have a minute um you mentioned earlier in your talk the importance of memory do you have any tips on really embedding things into students memory yeah so like read Dan Willingham because everything he says is is amazing gospel um so frequent testing there's a great book on assessment called make it stick and that's my favorite book on assessment ever um so do everything they say to do so it's things like allowing children a bit of time to forget so that then they really have to think hard about the knowledge being really clear about what you're recapping like don't yeah, I remember we, we, we were recapping on some mad thing going to, is this actually what we want them to remember for the long term? So think, what do we really want them to remember for the long term? Um, so be clear about what, and then just ask loads and loads and loads of questions. And then the other thing I'd say is make sure your assessments, when, when you give an assessment, it's not just on the unit you just taught, it also calls back to prior knowledge. Thank you. Any final book that you'd like to recommend or any great books that have have had the greatest influence on you and your teaching uh, I mean honestly there's just it's it, it's an oldie but a goodie like there's nothing better than teach like a champion it is it, it I use it every single day and um, the other book I'm using a lot at the moment is leverage leadership which is um it's just great when you think about how you set up a school how you codify your practice um I, I really enjoy everything that's come out of uncommon schools I think is really really impressive and then I'd also say anything by Edie Hirsch because he, Why Knowledge Matters is, is fabulous and probably the most accessible of his books, uh, but cultural literacy is, is just, I think it's the most important text about curriculum out there. Okay, thank you very much, Joe. That was really, really interesting. Uh, we've had lots and lots of questions, so I'll make sure that you get those uh, by the end of the day. Um, so thank you very much and have a lovely day. And uh, this was the last session this week. So we'll see you next week. We will be pu publishing um, the timetable for next week uh, very shortly. Thank you everyone.